songbooks this morning let's turn to page 438 let's stand and sing together with the choir my country tis of thee 438 let's stand and sing together please Brother Paul Adcock is coming to lead us in prayer this morning. Brother Paul? Let me say this, if you don't mind. About six weeks ago, I got a call from a man. He said, I want to call and tell you good news. He said, I just heard from my son, and he's not going to, if he continues to improve like he's improving now, and I've heard a lot of good things about this, he said that he won't have to have the operation that they scheduled for him in previous days. And I believe that young man's here today, and I'm really concerned about his dad. <coughs> now, maybe some of you know who I'm talking about. I, I've been told this is Jimmy Harvey over here. And his dad I visited six weeks ago. He wanted me to come up and visit with him. And I'm really concerned about Jim Harvey Sr. And I wish you would remember him. And maybe the, he told me before I left, he said, if you can get my wife to go to church, said I'll go with her. So that's is my goal to get them back in church and, and to see Jim Harvey get straightened out because uh, God's laid him on my soul. And I hope and pray that you pray for me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the Lord Jesus and what he did for us at Calvary. And may we ever be grateful and thankful for all that we have in Jesus. Thank you for this great church. I, I, I've missed it in the last few months. It's been a long time since I've been here, but I'm so glad that you 
allowed me another privilege to come and visit with these dear people. Dear Father, I pray for every individual that's come our way today. If there be one among us that needs Jesus, I pray that they'll see their need and have that desire to be saved and walk these aisles and pray that sinner's prayer. Bless and use Dr. Uh, Brother Walls in a special way. And may we all have that one desire, and that is to exalt and to glorify Jesus because he's worthy. In his name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Paul. You may be seated. The choir is going to sing for us at this time. Books again and join with the choir as we sing America the Beautiful, 438, 435, I'm sorry, 435. Let's stand and sing together, please. Shake hands with those around you. Fellowship one with another, if you would, please, as the choir comes down.
thank you so much for coming to Mount Pisgah Baptist Church on this holiday weekend. Thank you so much for being here. You could do us a favor, please, if you would, if you're visiting today for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Like you found a visitor's card, you can keep the ink pen, fill the visitor's card out, place it in the offering plate when it's passed here in just a moment. And our ushers are standing here. And if you're visiting today for the first time or first time in a long time, if you'll raise your hand, we'll give you a card, all right? If you'll do that for us, please. And uh, we appreciate you doing that for us. Thank you. All right. Good. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping us do that. I appreciate that. We have a couple of songs for you this morning. I hope it will be a blessing to you. Glory, if you'll come and sing for us. to the land with all my strength with all I am I will seek to honor his commands I pledge allegiance to
Amen. If you'll come, we'll take the offering this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we could never give back our pay to you for the great sacrifice you made for us at Calvary. And Lord, for the great sacrifices that others have made before us to give us this wonderful country that we have. We could never pay for that if we had a thousand lives to live. Father, we can do what you've asked us to do when we give of our tithe and offerings. We can do that. Help us be faithful in doing that. Bless now the gift and the giver. Use this day to honor you, I pray in Jesus' name. And I pray with thanksgiving. All of God's people said, Amen. All right, thank you. to encourage you to get one of these. It's simply a Christian life journal. It has empty pages for notes and good sayings. The road to success is always under construction. It's strange I would pick that one this morning. Just open it up. But uh, uh, just different verses of scripture at the bottom, a place for different things in the back. For you to take notes, they use sell for about $7. We paid $3.98 for them. You can buy them for $25. Uh, just $4. But you ought to get one. It's a good notebook to have for you. Wilma will have them uh, in her office after the services. If you'd like to pick one up, please. It'll just help you as you take notes and keep them together. You need to take notes. You can't remember anything. We can't remember any, I can't remember anything anymore. I can't remember where my notes are anymore, can you? So that's how bad it is. But it just to be helpful for you. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 6 as Brother Paul comes to sing for us this morning. Mark chapter 6. It's already on. Hope everyone had a good July the 4th, July the 5th, still celebrate for the weekend. Uh, the song I'm going to do, I had a young person ask me to sing a song. And uh, I was really surprised because this song is a song about need, almost about uh, a crying out. And the, the title of the song is Bring Back the Cross. <laughs> Watch to glory, Craig. Not to flip it, I'm sorry. Nothing like live performances, folks. I, and preacher, I know hates this, but he doesn't hate near as bad as I do. <laughs> I started out preaching, want to start all over several times. 
Well, Craig and I kind of went over this, but we, uh, no excuses, but it's been a very long two days for me, so. If we don't get it right this time, I'm going to let preachers sing Amazing Grace a cappella. It's a wonderful day, preacher, when things go well. <laughs> Even in despair The stars had lost their glimmer The stripes their majesty As I thought what is the matter Seems a glory spoke to me Bring back the cross By myself I cannot stand Bring back above for certain we've had our faults that's not what I'm speaking of but the cross and flag together oh they sure made quite a pair while the cross it was invisible all still knew that it was there bring back the cross by myself I cannot Mark chapter 6, if you'll stand with me, please. I'm going to read four verses. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Paul. And choir and congregation. Mark chapter 6. <clears throat> I want to remind you before I read these few verses, the chapter prior to this, Jesus has healed a demon-possessed man who's clothed in his right mind when folks come to see him. He's also healed a woman with the issue of blood who doctors couldn't help. But gee, he, she touched the hem of his garment was made whole. He also raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He's the God of miracles and of might and of power. But he's come to his own hometown now. And we read this about him. He went out from thence and came to his own country as disciples follow him. 
And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? Father, I pray in this hour you'd help us and make us a blessing. Speak through us and to us. Use us to honor you, I pray. Speak to our heart in this room, those listening by television and radio. Do with them according to the Spirit of God's working. And use us. I do my best to yield to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated, please. I want to take for a text this morning, verse number three, where I stop reading. Is not this the carpenter? In Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 55, a question is asked about the Lord Jesus. It says, Is not this the carpenter's son? In that text, he's called the carpenter's son by the writer Matthew or son of a carpenter. In Mark, the question is asked, is not this the carpenter? There's something unwritten about the life of Joseph that we're not sure about, but something that we speculate. Is that from when Jesus Christ was 12 year, years of age and was in the temple and spoke to the doctors and lawyers and he made one of his, his first statement of his public ministry, I must be about my father's business at the age of 12. And then according to Luke chapter 3, verse number 23, when he's age of 30, he was baptized. There's 18 years that we don't have anything biblically recorded for us about the life of Jesus. The last time we've seen Joseph is when he was 12 years of age, and we have no record of him after that in scriptures. I wonder, as I suppose, that from the age of 12 to the age of 30 is Jesus Christ is the eldest son because in this verse I read verse number 6 you see his brothers and sisters mentioned here and I don't mean to be unkind or critical this hour we know that Mary was not a perpetual virgin she gave birth to other brothers of Christ and half brothers of Christ and sisters of Christ as well amen we know from the scriptural account but we believe then that in those days that Jesus Christ very well could have been the breadwinner for his family and worked those 18 years as a carpenter providing for his mother and uh, for his brothers and half brothers and sisters believe it or not one of the fondest years of my life I can remember was back in 1962 I had graduated from high school and we had moved to moves different places we moved to South Dakota we moved to Arkansas we moved to Florida my father worked construction work and uh, daddy couldn't get a job so every week I would go to work I worked at the Twin Towers Motel at Cocoa Beach. We were constructing a six-story, six two buildings, Twin Towers, why it was called that. And every Friday when I'd come home, I'd give my paycheck to Dad because Dad uh, uh, could not work and wasn't able to make a living for his family. But really, I, I recall those days. They're sweet to me now. I didn't like them then. You know, when I had to borrow my own money to get gas, I just didn't like them, all right? But I figured he had done enough for me that it uh, wouldn't hurt me a bit, all right? Jesus has called many things in the Bible. He's called the bread of life. He's called the door, the way, the truth, the life, the lid of the valley. So many things we've not mentioned this morning, but in this text, he's called a carpenter. I want to give you a thought this morning the Lord gave to me several weeks ago on the carpenter continues construction. The carpenter continues construction. Now, in the Bible, don't find this to be humorous. We, the Bible speaks of God having a hammer. He let J.L. bar it one time, and she really put a guy to the ground with it when she nailed his head to the ground in Judges chapter 4. He uh, has a hammer, Jeremiah said, Is not thy word like a hammer? We know that God has a plumb line because he lets the prophets of God use it when he's going to measure Jerusalem. See, they don't measure up to what God has said they need to measure up to. We read about the line being measured, things being measured in the book of Revelation the temple without being measured, and then the holy city of Jerusalem being measured. So God has a measuring tape that God uses. I want to tell you this morning that I think five things, and there's probably more, 
that the carpenter continues construction on. Number one, and I'll deal mostly with this one. The other things I'll not be deal as long, and you'll see why in just a few minutes. Is he still building nations? Look in Jeremiah chapter 18 with me just for a second. Jeremiah chapter 18. And I want you to visit with me as Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house. He's making a visit there. And he goes in and he looks at this uh, potter as he's making a vessel. One of the most amazing things years ago when I was in Israel and down in Hebron is walking into a place, just in a, uh, a place with just a barely enough light you could see. And a man was standing there with a, a pedal and a, he's taking his foot and he's making a table go around. And he was taking wet clay and reaching over and molding it with his hand. Man, he could take that thing and all of a sudden he could squeeze it and all here come a vessel that high out of it seemed like a lump of clay that big. He just mold it with his hands. You could just see it fashioned with his hands. And he had several of them there sitting around. Some was not finished. Some had gone through the oven. Some had cracks in them that were re rejects or second we'd call. And some were finished where he'd set them. And Jeremiah is going to a place like that. And he's going to the potter's house and he sees a potter making a vessel. And all of a sudden he sees this vessel being broken. And Jeremiah is wondering what the message that God has to say to himself through the visit to the potter's house. And we come to Jeremiah chapter 18, if you would please with me. And look at verse number 6. And let me read to you what he says. He says, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the, hand, in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil I thought to do unto it. What time I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, there be not my voice, then will I repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So what God is saying, that he has the power to build up a nation or he has the power to tear down a nation. God has that power and that ability. He is the carpenter still is under, there's some things still under construction by the carpenter. It would be good if you'd recall with me just for a few minutes, he took Abraham, one man, his family, and built a great nation of Israel from that. Still exists as today, all these thousands of years, God built that nation. And he gave a promise, I'll bless them that bless you, I'll curse them that curse you. God gave that promise. We, if you've been here on Wednesday night, we've been studying the book of Daniel. We've seen the nations that God has built, and we've studied them in history, and we started them seeing Daniel's prophecy hundreds of years before they ever happened. Then we've seen them come to pass, come on the scene, go off the scene, because God has the power to build nations, and God has the power also to destroy nations. And that's why I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen? See, our greatest asset is God, but our greatest liability also is God. If you'll think with me for just a few minutes as you turn to Amos chapter 4. Turn to Amos chapter 4 with me just for a minute. I'll let you have time to find it while I talk with you just for a few minutes. This morning, listen, I'm not one that's quick to pass judgment. And I'm not trying to be someone that stands up here this morning and just say, you look at this and you think what's going to happen but folks, you've got to be blind if you can't see some things that's happening in America today. Now, I think that to be ironic, and I don't know, I don't know how far I should go what I'm about to say, but I think it ironic of all the tragedies happening across America this very hour. Isn't it strange that after, and though it's gone on for years, that after this year of the announcement of the gay rights time at Disney World, that all the fires going through Florida. It almost reminds me of what God said about Sodom and Gomorrah and fire and brimstone falling out of heaven. Now, I, I'm not sure that's the case. I cannot be dogmatic and say that, but I say it has crossed my mind and probably your mind as well. And when I think of not only that, and I think of the floods in the Midwest and the East and the loss of crops in other states, the earthquake in Tennessee, just the other morning, it woke us up and got us out of bed. Is there anything like that in the Bible where things have happened where God is trying to get the attention of a nation? And certainly there is. 
If you look in Amos chapter 4 with me just for a second, and let me read to you verse number 6. I'll start in verse number 6. He says, and here's the prophet Amos, who was not the son of a preacher, or no one in his family was preaching. He's preaching to a, another country. He's not even from. He's the southern part. He's preaching. He said, and I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And also I have withheld the rain from you, where there was yet three months of the harvest, I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, the piece whereon it rained not withereth. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied, yet they have not returned to me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blastings and mildews when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, and palmer were devoured them, yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have said among you the pestilences after the matter of Egypt, your young men have I slain with a sword and have taken away your horses. I have made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils, and you have not returned to me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and as you were as a firebrand plucked out the burning, yet you have not returned to me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord unto thee, O Israel, and because thou hast done unto thee, unto thee prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. God said, I have warned you, and I've warned you, I've let this catastrophe happen, and that catastrophe happen, but you've not returned to me. I've had my hand stretched out, I've reached out to you, and but you've not come back to me. He said, I want you to know I'm reaching out to you. I think of the prophecies of Jeremiah, the writings of Amos. I think of the writings of Isaiah the prophet, when in 39 chapters he tells of destruction of a nation, but then he tells in chapter 40 how God holds the nation in his hands and how he's able to rebuild those nations because righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, it used to be a proud thing when America would say, and I'm still proud to be an American. I thank God I'm American. I still, get, I still like the Star Spangled Banner. I still like the fireworks we set off. I enjoy all those things. And I, I remember the days of, of our greatness and uh, playing uh, for Olympic gold and the hockey games and all those things, I recall. And I enjoy that. And first say, America's number one, number one. We're number one. We're number one. We're number one. And that's wonderful to say that. But there's some things America's number one in I'm not proud about. Did you know that... America is number one in homosexuality. Number one in feminism in the sense of activists. Number one in abortions. And it'd be good for America to take heed to this this morning, what God said to the nation of Israel, if my people, not talking about anybody else, not talking about anybody out in the world, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, thou hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I will heal their land. America, listen ladies and gentlemen, America had a good godly foundation we started on. Don't you let anyone try to rewrite history and tell you we're not a Christian nation with Christian principles and Christian foundation. That's just not the truth. We were greatly founded upon the great truths of the word of God. In 1778, James Madison, the architect of the federal constitution, the fourth president of the United States said, we stake the entire future, the whole future of America, American civilization, not upon the power of government, far from it. We stake the future upon the capacity upon each one of us to govern ourselves and to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. The fourth president of the United States said that, the, that it was not the government we depend upon, it was us able to govern ourselves and control ourselves and, and by looking at and doing what the Ten Commandments ask of us. Isn't it, isn't it strange? that now we cannot post them in many, many federal, federal buildings. A judge in Alabama now, Judge Moore, fighting to have that privilege to do so. And all, uh, can't post them in federal buildings sometimes. Cannot post them anywhere without someone fussing and arguing when we know it's a good foundation for us. April the 30th, 1789, George Washington, the founding father, first president of the United States, after being inaugurated, prayed this prayer. My fervent supplication is to the, all, the almighty being who rules over the universe who presides in the council of nations and whose provincial aid can supply every human defect that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States of America. We're not to expect the smile of heaven upon a nation who disregards the eternal rules of order and of right which heaven itself has ordained. How can we sing? And it's hard for us. I enjoy God bless you. I'm not making fun of that song. We can't ask God to bless greed. We can ask God to bless ungodliness and unrighteousness. We can't do that. 
1820, Daniel Webster. He said, let us not forget the religious character of our nation. Our forefathers were, 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 uh, were the, watch what I'm looking for, were heavenly Christians who wanted to live for God and honor God. Maybe not Christians like we think in the sense of, I'm sure they had different than we did, but they journeyed by its light. They labored in its hope and they sought to indoctrinate every area of, of Christianity into schools, into uh, politics, into, into the arts, all those things for people to know about Jesus Christ. July the 4th, 1821, John Quincy Adam. Listen to what he said. He said, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one bond the principal civil government with the principles of Christianity. You see, the word separation of church and state is nowhere found in our Constitution. You may think it is, but it's not. You won't find it. You can't read it anywhere in the Constitution. It's not there. Because listen, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. We're not to, have, we're not to be governed by the state. Our church is not to have one. Our state is not to have one, one religion for all of us. Thank God for religious freedom. I think the Catholics have a right to religious freedom, don't you? I think that those even I totally disagree with have the right to, free, to, to, to the right of religion. I agree with that. But I want to tell you that government was never meant to exist without God. It was never meant to exist without God. Amen. Romans 13, praying for our leaders, trying to have a nation godly. I love America. I love what I have in America. I love this place. I, I've traveled many places, many countries. There's no place like America. Rivers and lakes and reels and rocks and fertile reels and creeks and ponds and fishes and banana pudding. Well, I finally got an amen. I love its beauty. I love its history. Did you know in March of 1931, how many of you were alive in 1931? Let's see your hand. 1931. That's wonderful. Did you know in March of 1931, we, we adopted a song called the Star Spangled Banner? You know, there's, there are several verses of that song. We only sing one of them. We know one of them. And uh, the fourth verse of that song has these words in it, In God We Trust. They adopted that as a song of America. You know, in 1954, the Congress of the United States added two words to our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. The two words they added were, under God. The Congress had those words, ladies and gentlemen. In 1956, there was a motto adopted by the con Joint Congress and, and say representatives, who, our House of Representatives, who, 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 who joined these things together. Jointly they said this, there's going to be a motto upon the money that we spend. The motto, you can see it, it says what? In God we what? It's there. Because our officials said let's have it there. We were built right but America needs to return to its heritage this morning, one nation under God. Because God has the power to build nations up. He has the power to tear nations down. I do not fear what China can do to us. I do not fear what Pakistan can do to us. I do not fear what India can do to us. But we certainly ought to fear what God could do to us. Amen? He's still building nations. That's not all. Look at Matthew chapter 16 with me, please, if you would. Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse number 18. And I said unto thee, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to tell you, the card for every God here. I like what I heard Harold Sattler say about the church. They was complete in its conception. And our God knows all things beforehand. I'm not preaching predestination of a lost man going to hell. There's no truth in the Bible about that. But I do believe God knows his children. He calls them by name. And I believe with all my heart that he's still building the church. He's in the church building business. Amen. Amen. You know, one thing I, I, I've been trying to do these last... Uh, last uh, few months in particularly more seriously than before, not that I wasn't serious before but it just never came to my mind, is you need to find out which way God's going and get in on it. Amen. <laughs> if you can find out which way God's going and get in on it, there's blessings there. And God's in the business of building his church. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
And we're lively stones in 1 Peter 2. We're lively stones in God's building. That's what we are. We're the stones that God lays in his building. We're lively stones in that building. Now, some may forsake it, Hebrews 10, 25. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together, no matter some is. As you see the day approaching, but so much more. We see so much more we ought to be together as we see this day coming, of the Lord's coming again. We ought to be here. We need fellowship with each other. Listen, we need, we need the perpetual blessing that God has promised to his church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Shall never overcome it. No, never, never watch it. Shall not withstand its attack. Because we're here, we're in doing what God wants us to do, and God builds us. Let me tell you something. God's interested in his investment in Oliver Springs, Tennessee, through Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. Through the church you attend and where you go, God's interested in that because God's in the business of building churches. I've heard uh, recently through some preachers I know there's 3,000 counties, and there might be more than that, in America that does not have one Baptist or one church there. I wish God would give me the opportunity before I die to have opportunity to help put a pastor somewhere in one of those communities. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't we like to do, do that? We'd like to be a church that had a part. Uh, I know we have missionaries. We support 140 missionaries, and that's wonderful. And we are, we are, we are going to support more. Amen, we ought to. We're going to. Is that right? But wouldn't it be wonderful to have a church somewhere? We said, we've started. We helped build a church there in that place in America. I think of the story in Luke chapter number 7 where Jesus, was, they were asking the question, should I go to this man's house and should I take care of this need? And said, he loves his nation. He's built for them a synagogue. And may we show that love for diligently serving the Lord to our nation by being faithful to the house of God. He's still building his church. This is not my church. This is God's church. Now sometimes I feel like I've got too much invested. Sometimes when I try to do things and get things out of hand, it's not mine. It's his. But I want to tell you, a church is no stronger than its individuals. And how committed we are to the task of getting the job done will help determine the destiny of this church under the will of God. He's still building a nation. He's still building his church. And look in Isaiah 54 with me for a second. Just two or three more. And I don't even want to read this one. And you might not agree with me when I first read it. But in Isaiah chapter 54, we're going to read some words that are not pleasant. But he says this. If I can find it. Isaiah 54. And if you found 54, I want you to find chapter 5. Because 54 is not right. Paul, you, I, you've rubbed off on me. <laughs> chapter 5, verse 14. I had it right to start with, but I didn't trust what I had down. Isaiah 5, 50, 5 14. Therefore, tell me what it says. Hell hath enlarged herself. Now don't you get upset with me. It's a subject that no one likes to talk about. But God's in a construction building of hell. Now hold on a second. Now wait a second. Have you ever known anybody that worked at something they didn't like? I think of those steel mill workers who go in that hot, fervent, fervency of heat and almost burn up as they work inside those buildings. I want to say this is a line of work that God doesn't like. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God's not a big God sets up in heaven and look down and says, all oh, you bad people, I'm glad you're going to hell. God never has been that way. God, never has, God will never be that way. Amen. God's also he's a God of light because he's holy. He's without sin. He's a God of love. But I want to tell you, the Bible says that hell in Matthew 25, 41, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. And the reason that it exists is because of the rebellion of the devil against the holy God. And the reason it enlarges itself this very hour is because of the rebellion of man and rejection of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 20, verse 15, I mean, Revelation 20, 15. Whosoever's name was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The rich man died, Luke 16, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. It's enlarged itself. You know, I can understand why Knoxville could get bigger. I can understand why Oliver Springs would grow in other cities, but it's hard to explain how that hell could possibly ever grow because of who in the world would want to go there. 
what man is right mind would ever think of going to a place of perishing and of burnings forever and ever and ever and ever. There are those I speak to this hour that this time in a few months will be in the places of the damned. There are those that you and I will meet this week that in a short time will be perishing forever. There are those who are enjoying the air conditioning of this society who soon will never be comforted again. But one day God will stop construction because he'll cast the devil in for the final time and he'll quit construction of hell. And I want to tell you something. If you go to hell, listen to me now. This isn't just some irate preacher trying to just preach at somebody and put some fear in you about something that's not real. We found aside through the years. I want to tell you, if you go to hell, you'll go over the grace of God. You'll go over Calvary and the love of God that cares about you. You'll go over the will of God. You'll go over the death of the Christ and the Son of God at Calvary. You'll go over the resurrected Christ. You'll go over the prayers of saints. You'll go over the witness of friends. You'll go over the witness of loved ones. You'll go over the witness of the Holy Spirit of God that pricked your conscience right now. You know you're lost without God. If you go there, you'll go that way. The carpenter continues construction of nation, of churches, and of hell. Take your Bible. I got two more. Mark 16. Mark 16. Before I read to you the story of Mark chapter number 16, let me tell you, introduce to you a man called Peter. Peter, that uh, apostle who apparently was akin to me, he was always putting his foot in his mouth. He was talking when he should have been listening and listening when he should have been talking sometime maybe. And Peter denied the Lord three times. And one of the most, one of the most uh, I don't know, to me, one of the most touching verses of the Scripture in the Bible is in Luke's account of where Peter denied the Christ. And when he denied Christ, the Bible says that Jesus looked at him. There in Pilate's judgment hall, or Caiaphas' judgment hall, being tried, and Peter said, uh, I don't know him. And he curses and he swears, I, I don't have anything to do with him. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at him. And that was the last look that Peter ever had for the Son of God walked to Calvary and he died. And what a wonderful story. In Mark chapter number 16, folks, and if it wasn't a Bible, it would be hard for you to believe. I want you to see this. That Jesus Christ now has risen from the dead. And let me just say, I'm glad I serve a risen Savior. And people have come, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and, and verse number, number one, they've come to the tomb and they're going to prepare his body. Uh, they're going to put spices upon it. And when they get there, they find something very amazing. They found the stone has been rolled away. Amen. But listen to what it says in verse number five, Mark 16. Boy, you got to listen to this. Listen. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. It's an angel. He's probably been around thousands of years, but he's still young. And he was a man. How about, can I get a witness there? <laughs> he was clothed in long white garment, and they were affrighted. He said to them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Here's the verse I want you to see. But go your way. Tell his disciples. Tell me those next two words. And Peter. Isn't that something? You know why? Because the carpenter is still helping people reconstruct their lives. You got a broken life? You got broken dreams this morning? You got disappointments in your life this hour? You got things that didn't work out like you thought they ought to? What I want to tell you, thank God I serve a risen Savior who can help people put broken lives back together. Who can take a past that you've not been proud of and put it under the blood of Jesus Christ and go on with God. I've got a God that's able to do that. I'm living evidence of the fact that God rescues his people from despair. <laughs> if you want evidence tonight, you look up, look up here this morning, you can see evidence of a God who in his grace and mercy can help you and reach to where you are as you rebuild your life. Been broken over sickness, been broken over the loss of a loved one. I want to tell you, the power of the risen Savior has power. The carpenter is still constructing and he has the power to help you rebuild your life, put everything back together. We have a God that's able to give you the years the locusts have eaten up. He have a God that's able to restore you what you need. Thank God I serve a God like that. If I didn't listen, if I did not believe that this morning, I'd walk away. I'd close this Bible and never preach again. Because I meet so many people that say there's no hope, preacher. 
I mean, so many people that have failures in life, of which all of us will have. But there's a God who's able to put those things back together for you again. Thank God for that. Amen? One last thought. The carpenter still continues construction. John chapter 14. Verse 1. Very familiar. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. He said, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. If I go prepare a place for you, I'll come again. I'll receive you unto myself that where I am there you may also. <laughs> he's still working. <laughs> he got a place he's fixing for us. Isn't that wonderful? It's not construction. <laughs> Heard this story the other day. And I got to tell you the story. It's, it's humorous. I think it's humorous. This pastor where he's pastoring this church, he and his people just wasn't getting along. They both hated each other. He hated them. They hated him. I don't want no amens or nothing. Just want you to listen. So finally... He was offered a job at the state prison as chaplain. He took the job. He had one final Sunday at his church. He announced his final Sunday, and the house was jam-packed. They were so happy to get rid of him, they were so glad he was going. He got up. Now remember, where's he going to get a job at? Where's he going to get a job at? Tell me, so you know. State prison. He got up. And he took his text. I'm going to prepare a place for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you call getting the last one in. <laughs> well, this is not meant to be anything like that. The carpenter's still construction. He says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. Hebrews describes that place as they look for a city with has foundation whose builder and maker is God. Paul described that place to the Corinthians as this, for we know this, this earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens let me give you two more verses of scripture here's why we have all that hope we have this hour Mark chapter 14 turn to Mark 14 just for a second now I want you to see this when you find Mark chapter 14 Verse number 58. Our Lord is dying on, getting ready to die on the cross. They're bringing accusations against him. What he said, they said, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that's made with hands. For three days I will build another one made without hands. They tried to accuse him saying, now, you're going to take this building here. It took us 46 years to build. You're going to tear it down and build that building back in three days. We know from reading other passages of Scripture, he's talking about the building of his body. That he was going to be destroyed. Well, on the third day, he'd be built again. Let me ask you a question. Did he keep that promise? Did he build that building? Sure he did. On the third appointed morning, the Son of God arose. To announce to us victory that we have hope because he lives. He arose to defeat our enemies. He did the work that needed to be done to save us and to keep us forever. So I encourage you this hour. I encourage you. The work's been done for salvation. I encourage you to trust Christ. Our nation needs holy living and godly people. I, someone told me, Carl Broach just told me this little saying this morning. I'm, about, I'm through. I should stop. I want you to listen to this. This is catchy. You've got to listen to get it. It's all a sign on a marquee. It said this. The first word was eternity. Underneath it was these words. Smoking or non-smoking. Heaven or hell. What will it be? If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can know him this hour. Broken dreams, shattered lives, heartaches, he's the mender. The carpenter's still under construction. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.